Good morning, everybody. Before we get started, I just wanted uh, to let you know that we are waiting on confirmation uh, that we will be able to meet in person in the school building from next Sunday onwards. So keep an eye uh, on your emails for information about that this week. Uh, of course, though, we will still be continuing our online provision. And then I just wanted to remind you what I mentioned last week, that from next Sunday, we will be starting our Easter series. And we're encouraging you to share the link with as many people uh, as possible so we can share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ this season. Well, we have come to the end of this series in Genesis, looking back for the future. We've worked our way through the very first section of the Bible in Genesis 1 to 11 in this series. And we're not done with Genesis. Uh, in the future, we'll come back and do series on Abraham and Jacob and Joseph. But we will finish this series today. And if you've been with us for a while at Beechurch, you will know at the end of a series, we like to take some time. Time to reflect on what God has been saying to us individually and as a church. Time to reflect on his word before we move on to the next theme. Well, this obviously is a bit harder to do in our current circumstances. But one thing uh, you could do this week to reflect by yourself is make some space and read Genesis 1 to 11 in one shot. I did this week and, it, and I found it really helpful to see it as a whole. And what I wanted to do today was just share some final thoughts on doing that. And we started this series and gave it the title Looking Back for the Future. Because I honestly believe the answers to the questions we have about our world today can be found in Genesis. And that makes sense, doesn't it? I was trying to help one of my boys with some comprehension work this week. And I have, didn't really do a good job at all in assisting him because I hadn't read the start of the book. I didn't know how Rita felt at the foot of the volcano because I have no idea who Rita is and what she's doing at a volcano. And it makes sense, isn't it? We go back to the start to see how that shapes the future. And in doing that this week, I wanted to say just three final things that Genesis 1 to 11 shows us. So firstly, Genesis 1 to 11 shows us God. And it's been great, hasn't it, that we've been able to reflect on the character of God in this series. Right at the start, our very first week, we were reflecting that God is eternal. And through the rest of the creation accounts, we thought of his power, his authority, his creativeness, his generosity. In his dealings with people later on, we saw that he is both holy and just, but also faithful and loving. But what I've particularly seen in these chapters, and that which will affect the way we see the whole of scripture, is that God is a life-giving God. He is a life Giving God. And this separates him from any other ideology or false deity. Life is not accidental. We are not some playthings of the gods. Life isn't to be feared like in some ancient myths where the gods feared the growth of humanity as a challenge to their power. No, we serve the one true God who delights in giving life. We saw it in Genesis 1, 1, with just his word, he made life out of nothing. In chapter 1, 11, he calls into being plants, he gives life, but he calls them into being with seed so that they can keep producing life. In 1, 20, he called the waters to swarm with swarms of living creatures. He calls forth life both in volume and variety. And then we read the command that we'll keep reading throughout these chapters. Be fruitful and multiply. Animals keep bringing forth life and fill the earth with it. It's the same command that he will give to people. 
We see it again in chapter two, uh, chapter two. And in verse seven, God breathes life into the man and gives him the breath of life. And he says to the people there, I've given you everything you need to preserve life. I've given you everything you need to enjoy life because God is a life giving God. And there again, he'll tell them to be fruitful and multiply. Let's have more life, God says. Keep bringing forth life. And in chapter five, we see that working out. They will. We see this list of names. Life continuing, given by God. Even at the flood, where we saw great loss. Even there, we see God's commitment to preserve life. And when the flood subsides, Noah is commanded to let the animals off the ark. Why? Well, you've guessed it. Chapter 8, 17, so that they may be fruitful and multiply. And then that command given again in chapter 9, 1 and verse 7. People, the very reason God needed to send the flood. People. But God hasn't given up on them. No, to them, he says again, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and the covenant God's promise in 916 is a promise to every living creature why because he is a life giving God that's what we see in these first few chapters and these first few pages of the Bible a life giving God and it's important that we read this in the first few pages and in these chapters this is how we are introduced. This is how we are shown God immediately. Now, some will try and argue and say that the God of the Old Testament is a God of anger and he doesn't become a God of love until the New Testament. Well, they haven't read the first chapters, have they? He is a life giving God, a God who delights in giving life. And yes, there are some tough chapters in the Old Testament. We thought about some of them when we studied the book of Joshua together. But we work through them because we've read the first few chapters and we see that he is a life-giving God. And in that, we also understand the gospel too. When death enters the world because of sin, all seems lost. But the life-giver gives a promise in Genesis 3.15 of a seed. Of one who will crush the snake, the saviour. And we see God's promise in preserving that line through Seth, then Enoch, Lamech, Noah, Shem, and then Abraham. And as we look forward, we'll see Isaac and Jacob. And then further on again, we'll see Joseph, uh, David. And then we'll get to Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. The life giver in human form. So it be, should be no surprise to us when Jesus came and he said, I am the bread of life. Or I am the way, the truth and the life. Or I am the resurrection and the life. The life giver has come and he is the life. But also his promise to the people is this. I have come that you may have life and it is the life giver who goes to the cross who gives his life in place of mine but conquers death so that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life Genesis 1 to 11 shows us God. It shows us he is a life-giving God. Well, secondly, Genesis 1 to 11 shows us the world. And we see the world in all its perfection in chapter 1 and 2. But we have seen that that didn't last for long. In chapter 3, we see sin come into the world. In chapter 3, 7, we saw guilt and shame. And towards the end of that chapter, we see the ground cursed and ultimately people driven out from the presence of God. 
In chapter 4-7 we saw the warning of sin crouching ready to pounce. And immediately in 4-8 we saw the first murder. In chapter 5 we see continual death. In chapter 6 we saw wickedness so great that every intention of people's hearts was evil. We saw corruption and violence. Post flood we see that not much has changed. Again the intentions of people's hearts are evil from their youth. And just last week we thought of community united against God in rebellion. You see, Genesis chapter 1 to 11 shows us the world and it shows us that the world is broken. The world we live in now is not how it was meant to be. And the things that frustrate us and upset us, confuse us and hurt us are because we are living in a broken world. It is a fallen world. God made it perfect, but it is fallen because of sin. We live in a fallen world. I was thinking about food the other day. It's not unusual. I think about food a lot. I love food and God made food. And in the beginning, food, would, like everything else, was perfect. And food is still a gift of God to us. But now we view food also in a fallen world. And I was just thinking about all the issues around food, that they now range from food poisoning to allergies to obesity to eating disorders to greed to famine to starvation to exploitation. This good and perfect gift that God gave under the fall. And you can look at all these things God made perfect in creation. God gave family. But now we see marriage breakdown and divorce. God gave justice and we see corruption. God gave the body and we now know sickness and disease. God gave innocence and now we know shame and hiddenness. It's because the world is broken. And some of these things have an indirect consequence of living in that fallen world. But as we've seen in Genesis, often it's a case of a direct result of our rebellion against God. Our world continues to turn its back on God, to rebel against him, to reject his rule. Some have asked, was it unfair of God to show us the perfect world in Genesis 1 and 2 that we have never known? Is it like the end of Bullseye when the team had lost and they brought out the speedboat and said, look what you could have won? Because we don't live in the world of Genesis 1 and 2 and we never have. We've only known the world, Genesis 3 onwards. But the fact that it's there explains maybe that feeling we feel every day. That this isn't right. It's not supposed to be like this. But knowing this also reminds us that this isn't it. We've talked, haven't we, that there is a time coming when God will make all things right again. When the life giver will call us to eternal life. And the promise then is that things will be better even than they were in Eden. Romans 8 tells us that even creation itself is groaning and eagerly awaits that time when Jesus will come back. And we know that feeling, don't we? We know that this isn't right. We groan. But we also know that this isn't it. Jesus is coming. And then God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For all the former things have passed away. You see, Genesis 1 to 11 shows us that the world is broken. It reminds us 
that this isn't how it's supposed to be. But it also points us forward and reminds us that this isn't it. Well, thirdly, Genesis 1 to 11 shows us our role in the world. We've thought as we've worked through these attributes of God that they point us to worship this great God. The lives of the early fathers like Enoch and Noah have challenged us to walk with God, to diligently seek God, to seek his presence, his will and his way in our lives. But as well as these, we spent a lot of time thinking what it means to be made in the image of God. We thought how this wasn't one sole attribute, but can be seen in personality, morality and spirituality. But also gave us activity in rule and work and relationships. And all this helps us understand our role in the world. We are to be image bearers, designed so that when people look at other people that they were supposed to say how great God is. Now we know that this is distorted by sin, but the image of God is still there. And as Christians particularly, we should be showing the image of God to all people and pointing them to this great God, to glorify him. Back in uh, January 2020, we set some time aside to pray for God's leading in B Church for the future. Well, we've put that on hold a little this last year for obvious reasons, but we are starting to return to that now. It will be a major theme in our members meeting in two weeks uh, time. But one of the recurring themes that God put on people's hearts there as we were praying was the desire to be involved more in the community, to do more social action type of outreach. And that's great. But since then, I've been praying, God, what does that look like? And how is that grounded in your word? And I believe God has been saying right here, right at what we've been looking at. This is what it's all about, being made in the image of God and being image bearers in our society, in our community. So what could that look like? Well, firstly, there's that action element. People suggested things like, why, why can't we go and do a litter pick in our community? Well, how does litter picking show the image of God? Well, we saw that being made in the image of God means that we have dominion over creation. But we are to rule like God compassionately. So by picking up litter, we are showing those looking in what the rule of God looks like over creation. What we as people made in his image uh, carry on this rule and where we are committed in caring for our father's world. Well, and secondly, that then there's the care for people element, supporting the vulnerable and needy in, in our community. How does this display the image of God? Well, it is in our understanding that all people are made in the image of God, that all people matter and all people are valued because they are loved by God. And thirdly, we can show it in taking a stand for what is right. By standing alongside people in issues over human rights, because we know that all people are made equal in the image of God. It might also make, um, make, mean making unpopular stands for those who don't have a voice. You see, don't misunderstand me now. This isn't replacing word ministry. We're not losing our commitment to gospel outreach. We're still running our evangelistic services, schools ministry, holiday club. We're still committed to world mission and committed to training as I'm still convinced that you on your front line is the best witness to your friend. 
had an understanding that we are to be image bearers in the world. Then I think this means a call to our community, to action. With us knowing why we do it, but also being able to share why with all those we interact with. Being made in the image of God. Pointing people to Jesus Christ and glorifying him. So Genesis 1 to 11 shows us God. He is a life giving God. It shows us our world broken but it points us to a future and it shows us our role being image bearers in our world for his glory. If we were meeting uh, as normal in person today, we'd give time at the end of the service to reflect uh, and for anyone if they wanted to share. Well, may I encourage you now to keep reflecting on what God has been teaching you in these chapters. The sharing bit is a bit harder at the moment, but there are ways we are getting together. Coffee time after the service, the prayer session, 6pm this evening, your life groups. Why not take a few minutes in those for folk to share what God has been saying to them through this series. But let's keep praying together that God will continue to speak to us and lead us from what he's been teaching us in his word. Amen.